Cashflow Diary Podcast, episode 196. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. Hey guys, gals, people of all ages from all over the world. I'm glad that you guys are listening. And, you know, from time to time, here's what happens over here. We record a lot of the things that I do everywhere I go. And occasionally we end up with these little bits and pieces that are good, but don't really belong anywhere. But we don't, and we have to come up with a creative way to share them with you. And we, we have two such pieces at this particular moment. So here's what we're going to do. We're, we're just going to share them with you and you listen, you be the judge, but we think there's good stuff in here that will help you. And we just wanted to make sure that you had it. Here we go. She said, what three states would I recommend to invest and what would I invest in to start? The answer is, the correct answer is, what is your investor identity? So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And based upon how you respond, I'm going to give you the places I think make the most sense. So to use an example from the presentation, this is why this is important, is because if you don't do this, you're going to make a mistake. So I'm just going to ask her questions that relate to the financial targets, risk tolerance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and that's going to help me understand. So what is your primary financial objective, i.e., do you want to build your income or are you trying to build your net worth? What's more important to you right now? Income. Income. Got it. And that is that income today or income in the future? Today. Today. Excellent. Uh, do, are you concerned about taxes and mitigating your taxable liability? For example, if this income came in and was taxable, would that be okay? Or would you prefer it to be not taxable? That's not the answer to the question. She said, whichever nets the most, I want to know, do you, do you have a tax concern now that you're trying to mitigate? No. no. Okay, great. So if this income was taxable, that'd be fine. Excellent. All right. So when you say, when I say aggressive or risky, give me a picture of what that looks like to you. By the way, for those of you who aren't paying attention, remember when I said QVC and uh, uh, home shopping network or going to uh, timeshare presentations? What should you be writing down right now? Okay, keep going. <laughs> so uh, what would, give me an idea of what you consider to be aggressive. What would be an aggressive real estate deal, in your opinion? Vacant or 100% occupied? Which one is more risky? Vacant is more risky? Okay, excellent. And then uh, can you tell me about the last five transactions that you did? All resident. Is that what you're looking to do again? Let's assume they are available. Is that what you would prefer? So it has to be in California. So if it's outside of California, you're going to say absolutely no, even if it's a, uh, a 50% return. No. No, okay, so it can, so it can be outside of California. Yes. Do you under, did you hear how I asked that question and why I asked it that way? Excellent. All right, so, um, and you've done residential properties, so you're saying it, commercial properties or cell phone towers, anything outside of a residence is something you are not interested in. Okay, and what does make sense to you? <coughs> the return. And what has been the lowest return you've been willing to accept so far based upon your previous deals? Twelve. Okay, 12%? To 10 to 12%? Okay, got it. And is that cash on cash or is that total return on the whole thing? You can say, I don't know. Okay, that's fine. I asked that question specifically because when you use the profit analysis quadrant, we're calculating total return on investment in all four quadrants, not just cash on cash, because most people speak 
only in cash on cash, and that's okay. I just needed to know. So if you had, so let me ask you this question. When it comes down to the returns that you're looking for, how soon, how, what is the longest you could wait before you receive your next check? If we start a deal today, could you wait two years before you got the next check? You would one year. Okay, got it. So would, in that one year period, would you want 100% of your money back or could I just start paying you checks? Which would be better for you? Okay, that's fine. And in the past, typically the assets that you prefer, uh, have the individuals been, um, would you say they're the higher end properties or the middle? B? Okay, cool. That's absolutely fine. And that's what you're looking for still? Okay, got it. So uh, in the past, how have you found your deals? The MLS, MLS and door knocking. Did you, find, did you find most of them yourself? Really? Oh, okay. Real estate broker. So why not find another one like that? Yeah. Uh huh. I just familiar with states. Got it. So if you had access to a team that was familiar with those states, would that help you? Of course. Okay. Is there any particular state that you looked at that you go, "Ooh, I would, I wonder about this one." Um, uh huh. Like you like Vegas? Okay, that's fine. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Texas. Texas. Okay, excellent. Do you guys hear what I'm doing? Do you see how I'm asking questions related to all of these things to get an understanding of what she's going to say yes to? You've got to do the same thing. Because when someone asks you, hey, where's the best place to invest and what would you invest in? How many of you instantly go, well, I would do this and I would do this. And that's the problem. That's the time to find out. So, um, it sounds like she's open to some other asset classes. It sounds like to me that if it's in the B class or better neighborhood, that's fine. It sounds like that primarily uh, um, uh, some sort of passive income would be play would be okay, so long as we hit a, a minimum cash on cash return of 12%. And her idea of risky, and this is probably where we differ the most, is her idea of risky is vacant. My idea of risky is occupied. <laughs> that's probably the place where we differ the most so for me it's going to be difficult for me to work with her because i prefer vacant and how many of you are like why on earth do you prefer vacant it, well, well yes it's opportunity but when it's occupied i'm inheriting let's say for example i have one building my my largest apartment complex is 182 units when we bought that there are, let's call it 80 people who are already living there that's 80 relationships that have existed for a number of years that I don't know how they treated them. And I suddenly inherit 80 relationships. Now, for those of you who are married, did you just marry the person or everyone else in the family too? <laughs> right? That was a lot of merging you had to do. Does that make sense? And this is no different when it comes to inheriting those relationships that to me is a risk so i don't like it but if that's something for her okay now i know what i'm looking for but i've got to hit a 12 uh, a 12 percent cash on cash return so now comes the most important question what was your name again priscilla, priscilla are you looking to run this deal yourself are you open to working with the operator out of state you would work with someone else now you realize though if you work with someone else you might not earn as much as you would if you did it yourself. Exactly. Did you hear that? I'd rather earn a small percentage of something than a large percentage of nothing. Now I've got the room to go anywhere from, hey, here's a single family house, all the way to, hey, I'm putting together a syndication on an, on, on a, on an office complex, and here's what we're doing. I've got the room to play with that because of what she said. So now, based upon what you're saying to me, Priscilla, you like Vegas. Okay, great. Um, or Arizona, sure. All of those things considered, there's no reason to, for us to do something wholly different. I see reasons why Vegas is good. 
How many of you know can come up with at least one reason why Vegas is a sound investment market? Anybody? Shout it out. What do you think? Um, it's what? It's in recovery. It's in recovery. What are you going to say? Casino workers need a place to live, right? Now, there's, you could always say bet on sin and you will win. <laughs> okay. That, uh, here's the only thing I'm looking at is jobs. That's really what I'm looking at. Those jobs are resilient. That infrastructure, how difficult would it be to build another Vegas? It'd be pretty hard to build another one. So those jobs are probably not going anywhere anytime soon. Can those jobs be sent to China, Malaysia, Taiwan? Macau. Who? Macau. Yeah, 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 right, right. They're trying. They're trying, but you get my point. The point is those jobs are very, very hard to offshore. So for those reasons, it makes it a resilient market. Now I'm talking to the investor brain, aren't I? I'm not just saying... I like Vegas, because you should have seen her face when she said I like Vegas. It like lit up. I don't know why, but it did. So that's great. But those are the things I'm going to start looking for for her. I'm going to look for an operator who's in Vegas. I'm going to look for uh, the 12% cash on cash return, because that's what you're telling me you're looking for. It's not about what I want. It's what do you think, what's going to make, If and now if I didn't think what you were thinking was actually possible where you were talking, I'd tell you that too. But I have, there's no reason to try to sell you on a different marketplace. So you could do what you're trying to do in any of the asset classes. Single family houses, apartment buildings. Well, I probably slant towards apartment buildings simply because they're counter cyclical to the um, uh, single family house market. That's definitely something that's on my mind. The other thing that I would look at, and this is going to be somewhat out of the box, is that I would look for um, cell phone towers. Because they're awesome, <laughs> just letting you know. So that, that would be another way to be able to hit the goals that you're trying to hit. Uh, I would even consider possibly gas stations uh, could do that as well, especially if they have a convenience store attached uh, and you can buy the real estate with it. And uh, probably commercial retail. I would stay away from office, like the plague. <laughs> yes? Working on the business for me, I spend all my time as far as I think about it. Because working on the business is about me and personal development of me. So I, for all intents and purposes, am the brand at this particular moment in time. Cashflow Diary is not big enough yet to be bigger than me. Uh, It's getting there. (laughs) It's making that happen. So any sort of spiritual development, mental development, financial development, whatever work that you're doing, in that sense, on you, you got to learn to work harder on you than you do on your job, so to speak. And that's why learning the Pomodoro technique or techniques where you can chop up your time become important. Because if I can get my work day done in two hours, then I've got the rest of the day to hang out with my kids or uh, do, well, nothing. <laughs> you know, go to a friend's house. You know, those types of things are, are what it comes down to. Um, yes, Priscilla. Yes. Uh huh. Right. Yeah, there are many other states that the return are better, but what I'm trying to get you to do is ignore it because if you are a Nordstrom investor and you're suddenly going, ooh, 50 grand, 50 grand, but you don't know how to serve this customer, you're not going to make the deal. You're not going to make the return. It's not just about the numbers. It's, are you the correct person to serve this customer? And if you aren't, it's not, the return isn't going to happen. You need to be able to deal with or understand that when the operator calls you, like if you are working in a syndication with someone else, and when the operator calls you and say, here's what happens, you need to understand that that's probably normal, you know, for that class of property. And those are the expenses, and that affects the cycles of things. Like for one of my buildings for a while, I could track the timeliness of rent payments uh, would correlate with things like um, whether the NBA basketball team won or not. It was weird. All I'm saying, I needed to be aware of that, right? 
that's going to happen in a certain class of property that may not happen over there. And you need to be aware of that. If that's something that you're like, oh, my God, that's just weird. I can't deal with that. I don't care how cheap it is. It can be free. You're going to do yourself and that customer a disservice, right? If you think, yeah, you know what? Owning an Italian restaurant, that might be the thing to do. That's where all the money is. But the only thing you know how to make is Mexican food. That's going to be a problem, you know, for every customer who comes through that door. Yes. Yes, you can learn. Absolutely. It's not, I mean, I've dealt with people where they say don't buy one bedroom apartments. Don't buy one because yeah, I don't believe in one bedroom apartments. Certain areas might be worth it more if we have more problems. You know, I did property management. Sure. So I just want to know where they use the statistics regardless of because obviously if you're property management, you just start getting more problems. Sure. The first question, you're just asking the wrong first question, in my opinion. The first question is, who do you want to serve? Once you've got that answer, everything else gets clear. Once I know who I want to serve, if I wanted to serve military people, there's a certain place I would go because I'm best unique to serve them. I can't chase the dollar. I don't want you chasing money. I want you chasing who can you serve the best because whomever you're going to serve the best is where you're going to be able to earn the most money. Whatever that is. Yes, the returns, you've got to be able to ignore the quote-unquote returns of other demographics and other asset classes simply because you're not skilled at creating the return necessary there. That doesn't mean you can't learn it. That doesn't mean you can't hire a team that does it. You're just going to pay a price for learning it and learning how to do that first. That's really what it comes down to. What I'm saying is start with the customer or investor identity that you know and understand first, which is usually the one that you are most like. And then branch out. That's why I started with lower income property. I grew up Walmart. I know a lot about it. You know, that it makes sense to me. Now, my resort, it ain't Walmart. (laughs) Okay, it's completely different. It's a different class of customer. And I'm working with partners who understand that class of customer. The most important question, first and most important, is who am I going to serve? Once you know who you're going to serve, you can start looking up the population data and economic information to figure out where they are and go, okay, I can serve them, and then you'll do fine. When we're chasing the dollar, we make a ton of mistakes. Ton. Um, How many of you have found that out personally, (laughs) right? Yeah, you can't. Don't chase the money. Who am I I and my team most qualified to serve? Does that make sense? And this is a way of figuring that out. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. I was going to say, like, a lot of times I'm sure when you're asking your question, she probably doesn't even know how to answer some of those questions. I know that. You know, you wouldn't know if you would want to take on the risk of, say, a cell phone tower or multi-cam. Sure, sure. Whatever it may be. And I think sometimes we just go with what we what we have at the moment and let's say we want to start out. or Correct. Maybe she's already started, but now she's trying to take it to the next level. So you try to expand on, on what you have and how what markets might give me that Correct. opportunity. Well, the market, that, that that's why I asked her what market she had been considering because I was like, well, that's a decent market to do what she's trying to say. Had she said, hey, I want to do that, in uh, uh, in Sacramento, I'm like, uh, we got a problem. <laughs> it's not going to work in Sacramento. But she said Vegas. So I was like, okay, cool. Well, we could do it in Vegas. Here's the play that I think makes sense in that case. But that's why you got to ask these questions first to pull out of them the information that they do know. So should we ask essentially those questions to ourselves? Yes. The answer. most important investor identity is your own. Because then if you, <laughs> we've got to start there. And I always take down deals in the order of IMTD, individual, marketplace, team, then the deal. Me first, the marketplace second, the team. Because see, some of you, you've hired contractors that only know how to think in granite. And that's a problem if you aren't dealing in a neighborhood that's granite, Right? So uh, individual marketplace team, then the deal. The deal is the most interchangeable part and the last thing I care about and consider. I need to know about you. I need to know about the marketplace. Uh, then I need to know about the team. Who do you, who's going to actually execute this vision? Do they have experience in that? Is that something that they prefer? And then, and only then, do I care about the actual property you're going to do that with. <coughs> in that order. Those, yes, Omar? Yeah. Yeah. How do I develop that? What do you mean? I don't think I understand the question. You. Yes. You mean this slide right here? 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's that one. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah. What do you mean? How do I develop it? I just take the same questions that you heard me ask, put them on a sheet of paper, and I just ask them over again. It's actually not in the book. I will tell you how you can get my investor profile questionnaire for free if you'd like. Hold on. Um, you can go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash five sheets. Basically, uh, when I was doing wholesale transactions, I reduced a wholesale transaction down to five sheets of paper. <laughs> and those five sheets of paper are what, you're, what you'll get. Uh, and also the investor profile questionnaire is inside that download uh, if you so desire. And you can have um, that at no cost. Yes, Gigi? Yeah, absolutely. The best thing that the if I've if there's anything that I work at doing is becoming a proficient asker of questions everywhere I go. It's what I do. I collect them. I study them. I want to know. Every time I'm in the middle of the negotiations, I'm listening to the other side for the question that they're asking next all the time. Here's, in fact, here's one of the best questions that I, I ever heard in the middle of the negotiations. You know that weird moment where you feel like you're close to the end of a deal and you really want to just make sure it's solid, here's a question I give to you. You ask it of the person. So you feel like everything's good, but here's what you do. You simply ask them, hey, I'm just curious, is there anything else that I could give you to make this a better deal for you? Once they ask, answer that question, you now can ask for any darn thing you wanted and you'll likely get it. It's awesome. I get excited for that because that helps to get deals done and get them done faster. Because when someone, when you suddenly take them to, he wants to do something to make the deal better for me, well, this would be great. Cool. I have no problem with that. Here's what I would need from you. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they're like, oh, uh, okay. Everybody's happy and we're done and we move forward. It's anyway, have fun with that one. Okay. So that was the little bit that came from uh, a different live event and most importantly the concept of investor identity is huge and understanding it will help you make far less errors in your judgment with team members with marketplaces and as well with property selection it's one of the places that i promise you if you've had a deal go south that's where you made the error in judgment now, one of the things uh, that it, people often ask me is, Jay, how can I figure out my investor identity? Or more importantly, how can I get more information uh, on some of these negotiation skills and techniques, etc.? And you guys, you get to pick up a free copy of the book, Cashflow Diary, 10 Steps to Creating Wealth in Any Economy, and you can read it for yourself. I have seen some of you, you have highlighted it and marked it up, and that's uh, <laughs> encouraging to say the least. So send a text message to the keyword is book, text book to 72000, text book, B-O-O-K, to 72000, and that will get you straightened up with getting a copy, an electronic copy of the book delivered straight to your email. Now, this next piece that we're going to go through for those of you who are members of our Cashflow Core membership, etc., you know that on Tuesdays you get to participate with me uh, often on questions and answers, just random questions and answers, whatever got you stuck and we get you unstuck and make sure that I give you the answer to your specific challenge, whatever the deal is that you are working on right now. For those of you who aren't, well, here's a sneak peek into some questions that were asked and you can hear the answers. Everybody gets the benefit today uh, from this. But for those of you that are members or if you're in the trial, make sure that you go ahead and remember next Tuesday we're going to be together. If For those of you hoping uh, to, to know more uh, about that, again, just go take advantage of cashflowdiary.com forward slash start one dollar trial all words spelled out so let's do this q a see brandon has got a question have you ever walked away from a deal where the seller was not forthcoming in the information to their problems or failed to disclose other problems yes or being deceptive yes i was curious as to how you overcame that obstacle i don't i move on to the next deal 
Next question. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, if they're not going to tell you what's wrong, could, like, could you imagine? Think of it this way. If you go to the emergency room, if you go to the doctor, and the doctor goes, what's wrong? And you go, why do you ask? Or I'm not telling you. Or you don't need to know that. Just give me some, you know, Vicodin. What's going to happen? He's going to kick you out. She's going to kick you out. You're not going to get anything. You're not going to get anywhere. And even better than that, they ain't going to chase you out their exam room and say, wait, 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 wait. Let me talk to you. You're not the last patient. Definitely not the last patient that day. And you're not the last patient on the planet. So they're going to go do what they do. Be a doctor and serve those that are willing to listen and are willing to accept their help. And if that's not you, okay, next. So uh, let me see what we have here. Deborah. Deborah's got a question. You asked Haya, who is she serving? I'm assuming that is your way of directing her to the I individual part of the IMTD. That, okay. What I'm not understanding is doesn't she have more than one client individual that she is serving? The homeowner, the broker, any potential investor and herself, aren't those all individuals to consider the homeowner. Yes, 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 absolutely, Deborah. They are all they all are individuals to consider. That's why it's IMTD. So each individual in the com- in the in the deal has their own investor identity. For example, you mentioned obviously her uh, Haya herself is you yourself, you the investor yourself have your investor identity, and we've got to get that on straight. Once we've got that on straight, we've got to be working with the marketplace, right? The marketplace has an identity. For example, California has a certain identity when it comes to producing certain types of real estate and real estate-related benefits. Uh, but the team, so when you start talking about the broker, yeah, the broker involved has a certain identity as well. You need to know what that is. Now, just be, if it's a short-term deal, it's not always, or if it's transactional like it could be with most brokers, it may not be as imperative that his invest, his or her investor identity match. However, it's going to help if it does because if you're working with a person whose investor identity is the same, they already have naturally around them the resources necessary to execute. So, and definitely the potential investor, of course, the potential investor's investor identity, all of those are individuals to consider. The cool thing about that is when you begin to consider it, it narrows your marketing efforts and it makes you go, okay, here's the person I'm looking for, period. Here's the person I'm looking for. For example, to give you guys an an understanding, the person I'm looking for, when someone's going to, you know, buy a deal from us or invest in with us, I'm typically going to be doing business with a high income W-2 or self-employed individual who uh, is time strapped, but has some cash to work with. That's generally the profile, male and female. Some, most of them have kids, at least one, usually two. Uh, not always, but usually that's the case. And sometimes their kid is their pet, and that's fine. All of that is you know, uh, inside of there, but that tells me whom I'm serving. And when you know that, that's what you're looking for. Those are the characteristics you can begin to count on uh, for people who are going to, you're going to know who you can best serve throughout the entirety of the transaction. Just because someone is willing to do business or needs a place to stay doesn't mean they're the right customer or the right fit. Or just because there's an opportunity in a neighborhood doesn't mean you're the right person to be operating in that neighborhood. Earl, I think the owner of the property may be in jail or a mental institution. He set fire to himself and the house. Oh, okay. This is uh, this is starting off awesome. I am now trying to find out if a mortgage is still on the property. I can't see where the mortgage company has paid. I can't see where the mortgage company has paid the taxes since 2012. The taxes are being paid though. Last year was by a check. I guess the question is, how do you find out if a house has a mortgage and whom it is with if the owner is missing in action? Uh, the first answer is going to be title. If you can get a preliminary title search done, uh, or you're just trying to figure out, you know, that information, what liens are against the property. So in this particular case, uh, that's where you're going to start. Now, I don't know how much information you're going to be able to uncover, 
uh, in terms of even if you go, you know, sometimes they don't list the mortgages in such a way that it's easy to track down who they're with and all this other stuff, but it, it all depends. And you still, uh, yeah, they, they could have been, I mean, don't, don't assume that the mortgage company is paying those taxes. Somebody else could be doing that still. You just don't know. Um, there's a lot of unknowns, uh, that's for sure, but you definitely have uncovered a problem. If you find a way to its solution, that, that'd probably be a good idea. Update. Okay. He's in jail for in- <laughs> insurance fraud. The whole, s- the whole setting the place on fire thing. Got it. Looks like it may, may be in the bank's hands. However, I'm still digging because I don't see a trustee on it and someone paid the taxes in January. Would the insurance company have paid off the house? Uh, maybe they would, maybe I, I don't, the directly to the mortgage company, possibly, I, I don't know, uh, who would own the rights. Thanks in advance and the input. Um, yeah, you got to, it, it's going to start with the title company. That's where I'm going to start on this. Start with the title company, then try to, I mean, get a name. Get a name of the of the the person on title. Try to see what kind of records you can dig up at the county in terms of uh, if you can get an address, like where the mailing address specifically. If the mailing address on the tax, um, the property tax documents, the property tax bill specifically, are different than the physical address of the property, that's going to begin to give you a clue. Um, yeah, so the, somebody owns it. Finding out who is the, the challenge here, but once you find out who, then you just got to get them on the phone because I'm sure that whatever the problem is, they're willing to let it go. And I wouldn't know. Uh, maybe try calling the actual insurance company if you can find that out. I don't know. Look it up and see if uh, if this is if, did this incident make the newspaper. So try that. If this incident made the newspaper, that might give you some clues uh, of where to look. I mean, you've got those avenues. Uh, to to begin to start poking and and digging, I guess. Um, check with code enforcement because if the property is still in disrepair, it's probably on their list, right? Uh, and they know who the person is that they're they're mailing those notices to somebody, so somebody's opening those notices and reading it. So those are the things that um, that I would begin to do. Seth is asking, would you ever do a subject to deal with no? Without title insurance, no, I would never do a the, no. Uh, the the short answer is no, uh, especially if you were talking U.S. property. The answer is no. Do get title insurance. I've already been down that road of not getting title insurance on a deal before. Get title insurance. I there is no exceptions, uh, except well the 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 one exception is when title hasn't transferred yet, right? So you can still do a land contract or lease option. Title hasn't transferred yet. So it's not time to get title insurance yet. Um, you get title insurance once the title transfers. When that title transfer process occurs, get your title insurance. Justin, how do you find out how much repairs cost on a 137 unit property in a different city? Got it. Um, when you begin, when you're trying to figure stuff like this out, you're gonna have to break it down uh, so in a multi-unit property, you're going to break it down by floor plan. So the first thing you're going to need to know is how many one bedrooms, one or sorry, how many studios, how many one bedroom, one baths, how many two bedroom, one baths, how many two bedroom, two baths, how many whatever the configurations are. And you've got to break it down by, um, you got to break it down by unit type. Once you've broken it down by unit type, then you just take your standard components and place chart or room, do it room by room and just assume certain rooms are just going to be trashed. My web browser. I'm going to show you guys a, a site that uh, I forgot who shared it with me, but it was one of you guys, I think. And because uh, we put it in the Facebook group, homewise.com. And they are, so we used to always talk about the uh, Marcus, not Marcus and old chap. The, uh, the home cost and repair remodel uh, guide that was a physical book that came out every year. This might be the new thing to use. This is definitely the, the, the closest thing I've seen to a replacement to that. Uh, and when I look at how they're advertising the site here, or at least just this from this 
um, screenshot alone, even though they've used a non-Apple device for the screenshot, I will forgive them for that. Uh, the <laughs> At the end of the day, it shows me that they're doing things by material, by piece. They're calculating labor, and you can also do it by square footage of relative rooms, etc. So this, it's looking like what's going to be the, the thing that we can all use um, to go out there. I would love for some of you, maybe Paige or, or somebody who's doing a flip, not a buy and hold, but a flip, to verify some of their you know, materials and pricing. That would be really, really good. Uh, to just give us an understanding of how accurate uh, these these guys are, because if they're accurate, yeah, this could be that place where you can come. Either way, Justin, what you got to do is you got to begin to break it down room by room, or sorry, uh, floor plan by floor plan, and then room by room. You know, how many kitchens in the two bedrooms are you going to do? I have no idea, but you're gonna have to start figuring that out. It's a bit of a project, especially on something uh, at a hundred over a hundred units. But it's what you got to do to begin uh, the process. So uh, good luck with that, by the way. Jay, I negotiated sweet terms with the seller of 60 units over 20 buildings. Seller of 60 units over 20 buildings. I want to wholesale and keep some. However, the seller insists on a contract for deed, but I get depreciation and Keiko has said they can make this work. Okay, what's the question? <laughs> the other drawback is that they want one blanket contract for deed. They said I could wholesale the other properties on a contract for deed, but I would be responsible for the blanket contract, and they want a personal guarantee, credit check, etc. The more we talk, the more comfortable they get, but I am not comfortable with a blanket contract. I want individual contracts, and they keep telling me they have another buyer, which I don't think they do because they have conceded to no ballooned and non-recourse, but what is the best way to deal with the blanket so they feel comfortable with individual contracts? They say their problem is, well, what if you only make payments on the ones that are doing well? I know this is a trust communication thing. What's the best way to position myself? <laughs> Sorry for the broken text. The chat box is freezing on my mobile device. Thank you for the feedback about the technology. Jacob, if you're watching, let's figure out what's going on with the chat box on the mobile devices. Um, I was wondering what was going on. All right. So, Kyle, uh, here's the deal. You can, you, if, they're, if they want a blanket, you don't necessarily have to get an um, individual contract. Individual contract does make it clean. That is true. But now, instead of getting a blanket, what you need to do is get them to be agreeable to a partial release on sale. So as long as they're agreeable to partial releases, then you're going to be fine. If they're not agreeable to partial releases, then you've got no deal. If they're not willing to do a blank, uh, individual, you're not willing to be on the hook for all of them at once, and they're not willing to do partial releases, then, you know, move on. Um, as far as not paying on the ones that aren't doing well, just don't buy the ones that aren't doing well. <laughs> move on. <laughs> Buy the good ones, leave the bad ones, and, and move on if they're open to that. That's kind of how I see it. So hopefully that, that should clear that up a, a little bit and make a little bit more sense. Do we have any more over there or no? Yeah? Jay, one more thing. The seller has title insurance underlying loans, but I still want to check title, as you should. Can I do this through the county courthouse, or do I have to order full prelim $200 each seller wrote in contract that they guarantee clear title? Yeah. Uh, you know what, Kyle? Uh, they can write. They guarantee clear title if they want to. Okay, so if you don't want... Okay. If they're going to guarantee clear title, then what I want is a bond or an escrow account for the equivalent dollar value of about five houses. That's what I want. Five five houses at retail. If they want to guarantee title insurance, cool. Then I want a bond that says if somehow the, the, the title is defective in any way, this bond is going to pay me to indemnify me from any sort of issues, and then they're going to put a new bond in place. I think when you say something like that, they're going to, they would rather go down the title insurance route um, at the end of the day. So just keep that in mind. Uh, Michelle, on a lease option deal, the property needs about $10,000 in repairs to get it rent ready. 
okay? I have a private lender willing to put up 3K in escrow and to pay six months of mortgage payments and the $10,000 for repairs. Okay, how would a lender secure his position and get paid back in, let's say, five years? This is it's just a promissory note. Uh, there, there's nothing more complicated than that. So uh, if you've already got that, again, guys, uh, I've said this before, I say it again. Once you've gotten to that point, you've got verbal agreement in general of what you're going to do. It's not about you to know how the lender or how XYZ is going to secure their position. You take this to the attorney. You get on the phone and say, here's what we want to do. The attorney is going to tell you what documents to use. You are not the legal expert, and you're definitely not the expert on how the seller is supposed to secure their position. Your knowledge of how the seller secures their position and explaining to them, you think, makes you better. It's a liability. Please, just take it straight to the attorney and quit trying to tell, here's how, here's the tools we're going to use, and gee, don't I know so much. Just go straight to the attorney. If you've got verbal agreement, go straight to the attorney. I'll say that one more time. If you've got verbal agreement, just go straight to the attorney. <laughs> they will work through the details to help all the rest of the stuff come out. Uh, Michelle, on a lease option deal, the property needs about $10,000 in repairs to get it rent ready. Okay. I have a private lender willing to put up 3K in escrow and to pay six months of mortgage payments and the $10,000 for repairs. Okay, how would a lender secure his position and get paid back in, let's say, five years? This is it's just a promissory note. Uh, there, there's nothing more complicated than that. So uh, if you've already got that, again, guys, uh, I've said this before, I say it again. Once you've gotten to that point, you've got verbal agreement in general of what you're going to do. It's not about you to know how the lender or how XYZ is going to secure their position. You take this to the attorney. You get on the phone and say, here's what we want to do. The attorney is going to tell you what documents to use. You are not the legal expert, and you're definitely not the expert on how the seller is supposed to secure their position. Your knowledge of how the seller secures their position and explaining to them, you think makes you better. It's a liability. Please just take it straight to the attorney and quit trying to tell, here's how, here's the tools we're going to use, and gee, don't I know so much. Just go straight to the attorney. If you've got verbal agreement, go straight to the attorney. I'll say that one more time. If you've got verbal agreement, just go straight to the attorney. <laughs> they will work through the details to help all the rest of the stuff come out. Juan, how are you? My question is, is how do I get over the excuses and fear? Uh, Ron, uh, Juan, uh, well, step one is at least recognizing you have a problem. So good job. Uh, you have the excuses, you have the fear. Uh, and just so that you know, if your expectation is that they go away, then that's the problem. They're not going to go away. Life will offer you excuses uh, at every level all the time. I mean, there isn't a person that I'm aware of that hasn't been offered an excuse today. Even the ones that you think are successful or believe to be successful or are successful, whatever, th they all have uh, opportunities for excuses and fear. It's not that they don't come their way. They, we just choose to respond to them differently. Instead of trying to obliterate fear and get rid of excuses, we develop courage and character and move forward at the end of the day. There, there is no, I mean, there, there's always going to be something offered to you to easily accept. It's part of the human condition, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, it's like gravity. It's going to be present. You, you must choose to fight it every day. There isn't a day that gravity isn't working on you. Um, for most of us, our natural states, if left to ourselves, we're, 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 we're lazy <laughs> and in self-indulgent, selfish uh, little people, all about me, 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 right? And at the end of the day, anyone who chooses to rise above that is are those that tend to accomplish. So um, welcome to the human race, I guess. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> you just got to learn, like I said, developing courage and character, you'll get there. All right. 
So now you've had a sneak peek on the inside as well. We've gone over some concepts regarding investor identity. You got a, a sneak peek inside to what goes on inside the membership. Again, uh, if you want a shot at giving me or if you want to give me a shot at answering some of your questions live and becoming a member, you can start. Uh, we are currently having a 30-day trial. You can go over to cashflowdiary.com forward slash start one O-N-E dollar D-O-L-L-A-R trial T-R-I-A-L and uh, cashflowdiary.com forward slash start one dollar trial and you can begin to experience uh, everything that we do allow you to have inside the membership. Anyway, what I do want to say is, guys, hopefully this has been helpful for you. That That's our intent. That's the goal. And I'm glad when I always get a chance to meet you guys at some of these events that I've been at. It's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. <laughs>